Aristotle taught us that, in making a speech, one must study three points. First, the means of producing persuasion, second, the language, and third, the proper arrangement of the various parts of speech. Today we're focusing on the second of these, the language. If you remember Isabel Albanese's four C's of truth and communication, you will likely recall that contagiousness is involved with making your communication memorable. Clever word choice helps with this C. And that's what we will focus on today, making your verbal communication, your language, memorable. Let's focus on some literary techniques that would make your language more memorable or contagious, as well as a few more specific suggestions for improving your use of spoken language. There are a variety of strategies or literary techniques that you can use to make your speech or your paper more interesting and memorable. The ones that we will discuss involve making comparisons, adding human or animal qualities to inanimate objects or ideas, playing with the sounds of words, and then manipulating the order in which you put the words. You can find more information and more examples by going to AmericanRhetoric.com. We'll start with making comparisons. Two main techniques are metaphors and similes. A metaphor is an implied comparison between two dissimilar things. You start with a concept, say, time is money. Once you have this concept, you can use your language to relate the two, such as, you're wasting my time, just like we waste money, or I invested a lot of time in her. Some other examples include, Cindy was such a mule, we couldn't get her to change her mind. Well, that works because mules are considered to be stubborn animals. Or, the poor rat didn't have a chance. Our old cat, a bolt of lightning, caught his prey. In Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, delivered in 1963, he connected brotherhood to music. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. Beware of mixed metaphors, however which is when a speaker combines two images that do not logically go together. I have a lot of black sheep in my closet, mixes black sheep in the family and skeletons in the closet. One potential problem with metaphors is that if you use a cliche or a concept that is not known to others, you could confuse your audience. I grew up knowing that black sheep in a family means that there are some family members who, euphemistically speaking, did not meet the family's high standards. But someone, perhaps from a different culture, might not get that reference, or at least not immediately. Similes are very similar to metaphors. However, while metaphors are implied comparisons, similes are explicit comparisons. You make sure we understand what you are comparing by using the words like or as. Wasting time is like wasting money would be a simile. Playing chess with Ashley is like trying to outsmart a computer uses the word like to explicitly make the comparison that Ashley is very smart, like a computer. Or, his temper was as explosive as a volcano, using the word as to make the comparison. A very famous example is from Forrest Gump, when he said, My mama always said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Another technique is adding human or animal qualities to inanimate objects or ideas. And the two main methods are personification, also known as anthropomorphism, and zoomorphism. They're really basically the same. The only difference is whether you're adding human qualities or animal qualities. Personification is the attribution of human qualities or characteristics to inanimate things or objects. You may have heard the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention, which attributes the human quality of being able to give birth to the concept of necessity. The window winked at me, and the ancient car groaned into third gear. Well, people wink and groan, but not windows or cars. By attributing human behavior to the window in the car, however, we have used the method of personification. Zoomorphism is the same. In this case, the ocean roared as if in pain. Or, an example from Mice and Men, and he, Lenny, walked heavily, dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. In this case, we've used zoomorphism to attribute the characteristics of a bear, an animal, to a human. Two techniques, alliteration and assonance, involve playing with the way words sound. Alliteration is one of my favorites. It's fun to say and enjoyable to hear. Alliteration is like rhyming, but with alliteration the rhyming comes at the front of the words instead of at the end. It is the repetition of a consonant sound several times in a phrase, clause, or sentence. Let me give you a quick example. A line delivered by Mike Myers in Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery when he asked, Isn't that what being an international man of mystery is all about? In this case, he's emphasizing the two M sounds. 
A longer example is from the 1959 movie classic, The Wizard of Oz, when the wizard ordered, Step forward, Tin Man. You dare to come to me for a heart, do you? You clinking, clanking, clattering collection of caligonous junk. And then he continued with, And you, Scarecrow, had the effrontery to ask for a brain, you billowing bale of bovine fodder. Similar to alliteration is the technique of assonance. Now, while alliteration repeats a consonant sound, assonance repeats a vowel sound. You may be familiar with the song from the musical My Fair Lady about the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain, which repeats the A sound. Johnny Cochran, during his closing arguments at the O.J. Simpson trial in 1995, used this technique very effectively when he said, The gloves didn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Repeating the short I vowel sound. In the 1968 aviation film Top Gun, the two main characters claimed, I feel the need, the need for speed. Because the vowels are open sounds, it creates a generally soothing effect, and the repeated sound also makes the information easy to memorize, which is why it's very popular in advertising. The last strategy we will discuss deals with word order. Two techniques, parallelism and antithesis. Parallelism is a similarity in the syntactical structure of a set of words in successive phrases, clauses, and sentences with the same or very similar grammatical structure. It's similar to playing with sound. It helps by creating a rhythm with your words. Hopefully the examples will clarify. Like father, like son. This is not only just what I wanted, but also just what I needed. You should be able to see the parallel structure in George W. Bush's speech to the nation on terrorism right after the 9-11 World Trade Center bombing, when he said, We have seen the state of our union in the endurance of our rescuers working past exhaustion. We have seen the unfurling of flags, the lighting of candles, the giving of blood, the saying of prayers. Antithes also uses a parallel structure, but this time one section contrasts with the other section. For example, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Adelaide Stevenson, who was the Democratic nominee for U.S. President in 1956, said, To close the door to the conference room is to open a door to war. And President John F. Kennedy once admonished, Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Another example is from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now let's get a little more specific on how you can use your language more effectively to make what you say more memorable to your audience. First, consider your words, particularly with your audience in mind. Use words that are appropriate for your audience and for your topic. This may mean examining the demographic makeup of your audience. This could determine whether or not you could or should use slang or jargon. Think about political correctness in your use of gender pronouns, for example, and the educational level of your audience would lead you to choose different words as well. If you're aiming for immediate understanding, use short common words effectively. Work on improving your vocabulary, both in your writing and your speaking. Consider using a book of synonyms and antonyms. Use a dictionary more frequently. And when you increase your vocabulary, then, you will have at your command more than one word or expression for the same concept, so that you don't end up using the same words over and over. When you are writing, the repetitive words seem to jump out at you. I notice that, for example, when I write, I tend to use the word significant a lot. If I notice that I have used that word four times in three sentences, I will go back and find alternative words, such as dramatic. When you speak, you want to do the same thing. Practice in writing will help those words be on the tip of your tongue while speaking. Another suggestion is to look at how style is used elsewhere. Advertising is a great place to find creative techniques in practice. Pay attention to how style is used in newspapers, political campaigns, radio advertisements, television, posters, movies, and then figure out how you might be able to incorporate some of that style into your writing and speaking. This could be particularly helpful when you are working on, for example, an attention-getting introduction, which leads us to the next one. Use stylistic techniques when you want to capture your audience's attention, to remember your key ideas, or to economize your words. Let me give you an example. You may have heard that there are four considerations when selecting a diamond, called the four C's. Cut, color, clarity, and carat weight. Well, actually, there are five C's because jewelers often omit the fifth consideration, which is cost. 
Notice that this technique uses alliteration with the hard C sound repeated. This would be nowhere near as easy to remember if the words used were design, color, clearness, size, and price. It's one thing to know the theory, yet if you don't practice what you've learned, it remains just that, theory. Actually use your improved vocabulary and stylistic techniques in your messages, both formally and informally. Take some risks. When you write an email message, for example, think about how you can make it more interesting and memorable. When you are in a conversation with a friend, think before you speak. See if you can liven up the conversation with your language choice. Both of these are ways to practice what you've learned. For word choice, I recommend a word-a-day calendar. While I likely already know the daily word, I rarely use those words in conversation. Instead of leaving the word attached to the calendar, rip off the page and carry it around with you throughout the day, giving yourself the goal of using it at least five times appropriately. And then that word will probably become more a part of your regular spoken vocabulary. And then finally, try to be original. We get tired of hearing the same cliches over and over again. Be careful, however, of overdoing it. If you go overboard, that can make your message more difficult to understand. Moderation is key. Quiz time. What is the difference between a metaphor and a simile? Can you think of a slogan or product name that uses alliteration? And how can you improve your use of language to achieve the contagiousness of the four C's? Now that you know more about language, you should be able to use it more effectively in your speeches. Be creative when you design your speeches, and your audience and I will definitely appreciate it.